Greetings Ranger fans, Jake here for a deeper look at Mighty Morphin Power Rangers once and always. But first, a rapid run through. Let's kick off the counter. It Actually, I I need the right morpher for this. Ah, there we go. And can we get a bit more color in here? That's more like it. Oh, we're definitely going to need more time on that clock. All right. Now, let's kick off the counter. It's morphin time. Okay, so after an opening text crawl, we open on Billy Cranston lying on the ground. What? With Robo Rinda's army of putties looming over him. What? So he instamorphs into the Mighty Morphin Blue Power Ranger. What? He's quickly overwhelmed, but the other five original rangers come to the rescue. Two exploding title smash. They fight the putties while he smashes Robo Rita's face, leading her to cast a spell to kill. Wait, can we use that word? But then Trini leaps in the way. Oh no. And she's gone. While the rangers stare off in shock, Rhea leaves them with their grief to return to the dark dimension. Not sure why she doesn't use the curse again, but Billy and Zach go to Trini's house and discuss how best to manage her daughter Min while the others search the dark dimension, only for Min to walk in on them recapping the last scene. Whoops. She doesn't take it well. One year later. Zach's quit his job as a congressman to be Min's guardian, who returns home from her praying mantis kung fu training to join him for their trip to the cemetery to meet up with the others. But Robo Rita's back. They spot the already morphed rangers facing off against her and her recreated monsters. Robo Snizzard and Robo Minotaur. Snizzard poisons and captures Jason, Tommy, and Kim in miniaturized lightning collection form and pops Min to read his new mystery machine, so Zach, Billy, and Min retreat in Radbub too. Now a convertible. Min digs into them for not letting her help, blaming Billy for Trini's death before they leave her for Cranston Technologies to track Robo Rita with the help of Alpha 9. And we get a recap of how Billy tried to reconstitute Zordon from the remnants of the Z-Wave. With the help of Alpha 8. Wait. The energy they capture turned out to be Rita Repulse's dispersed evil essence, turning Alpha 8 into Robo Rita. But the flashback is interrupted by a worldwide putty attack, activating Bandora Protocol to warn all the other rangers, and bringing in Cat and Rocky to cover for Kimberly and Jason with the proxy power coins. Don't care how dangerous too much pink energy is. They all morph to go after the putties, but Robo Minotaur's ranger tracker draws the monsters to the scene, so the rangers retreat when the civilians are safe. But not in time to save the bulk food company billboard. Alpha 9 warns all the rangers to demorph, so the Mighty Morphin team powers down before returning to base, where they get an incoming message from Adam and I. They're too far to teleport, but mention Billy's new stealth technology, which gives them an idea to distract the monsters and sneak into Robo Rita's newly discovered, newly reclaimed Moon Palace, but they're soon interrupted because Min is fighting putties in the juice bar. She caught Annie's bus blast report and nabbed Trini's old morpher to morph herself, which does not work. So Rocky and Zack teleport in to help with some spin kicks and Hip Hop Keto! After clearing the youth center, they take Min back to Cranston Tech to have a heart to heart with Zack about the poisonous nature of revenge and how Zordon had fathered them all as heroes, while the others go off to a junkyard to trap Robo Minotaur and Robo Snizzard with a crane magnet. Heck, <laughs> cat pilots a crane. They return to base, turn invisible, and teleport to the moon, but Min Min's upset that the monsters are left alive and sneaks off to steal Radbug too, saving the guy's boyfriend from putties on the way there. Got a little clay on your windshield there. Min flies to the junkyard, but the morpher is still not working for her, so when Robo Rita pops up to save her minions, she quickly captures her, then interrupts the four rangers up at the Moon Palace, who just discovered that Robo Snizzard needs to be destroyed to free the others. Not sure why they didn't do that before. And that Rita's been powering a time portal to contact her younger self and erase 30 years of history by killing the younger rangers in their sleep. Not sure why she didn't do that before. Billy summons his blade blaster to attack Robo Snizzard, but he and the others are quickly knocked aside by Rita, who threatens them with a second killing spell, but Min jumps to take the hit. But really, it was her morpher that took the hit, flooding her mind with flashbacks of training's time with the Mighty Morphin Yellow Power Ranger and granting her a mom's power. So now, it's morphin' time. They summon their power weapons to fight off the putties and monsters, but Rita tosses Snizzard off the balcony to protect her plan and make her monster grow. But this doesn't protect her from Billy, who impales her from behind with his power lance. Before calling Alpha 9 to summon the dinosaurs to the moon with a CG shot-for-shot -shot recreation of the transformation leading to giant Megazord fight on the moon. So Billy and Min fight Robo Snizzard while Cat, Zack, and Rocky finish off Robo Minotaur with their power weapons. Stabby, stabby. And then join in to defeat Robo Snizzard with the Mega Power Sword just as Robo Rita recovers enough to activate the time portal so they return to the palace, pin her down, save the rangers, destroy the machine, and let Zack deliver the finishing blow with his power axe. For Trini. So the day is saved, but the captured rangers are still tiny, so they hand them off to Adam and Aisha, who are taking them back to Aquatar to get them fixed up, where Sester is still waiting for Billy. But he has unfinished business, so they bid farewell to the replacement rangers. May the power protect you. Before he and Zack take Min down to Juice Bar, where she apologizes to Billy, and they wonder if the memories in her morpher might mean that Zordon is still out there somewhere too, together reminiscing about the heroic adventures of Trini Quan. Roll credits. After a short flashback clip of Kimberly singing to the whole team, dedicated to Tweet Trang and Jason David Frank. And that's the end of the episode. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I'm out of breath. Give me, give me just a moment. <sighs> okay, so that's the end of the episode. Now let's take a deeper look. Obviously, the 30th anniversary is a big deal, as it only comes around once in a show's history. And very few shows ever make it this far, or at least not without a significant period of dormancy like Doctor Who or Kamen Rider, with Power Rangers source material Super Sentai being one of the very few franchises to pass that marker, with their 50th anniversary now being only a few short years away, and I am feeling so very old right now. But that being said, this is far from the first milestone that Power Rangers has ever celebrated, as we've previously marked the 10 
10-year anniversary with Forever Red, the 500th episode with Legacy of Power, the 15-year anniversary with Once a Ranger, the 20-year anniversary with the entirety of Megaforce and Super Megaforce, culminating in the legendary battle, and the 25-year anniversary with Dimensions in Danger. So I think there's some value in analyzing Once and Always through the context of these past specials to really see how it measures up. So buckle up, because we've got a whole lot to cover here. Now, I've already covered Forever Red in excruciating detail through Database Rangers Power Reviews, which you should absolutely check out if you haven't already, and maybe check out a second time, because it was our last episode released before the big three-part finale coming out this summer, but there are a few points here that I think are worth addressing specifically within the context of Once and Always. Not only did Forever Red set the bar for the franchise even having anniversary celebrations, but it also introduced many of the tropes that we see coming into play again here. Returning Rangers, playing opposite other Rangers they had never previously met on screen, resurrected villainous forces from the past, and little nods to bits and pieces of continuity from throughout the franchise have now become something of an expected norm for anniversary specials since then. Obviously with some specials hewing closer to those tropes than others. But we have more specific plot beats being revisited as well. The introduction of a new Alpha Unit, a new Ranger base that serves as an homage to a previous Ranger base, Bulk and Skull running a new business together, visual nods to classic Ranger vehicles, and a climactic battle set on the moon that culminates in a fight with a classic Zord being fully recreated with CG are all elements that had previously been touched upon in the original Forever Red. However, despite all these similarities, it never truly feels like a rehash of Forever Red itself, as it definitely has enough of its own unique story and character elements to set it apart. So ultimately, I would argue that these parallels actually serve to enhance the sense of legacy that this special is embracing, providing an homage to not only the origins of the franchise, but also to the origins of this exact type of milestone celebration. Speaking of which, let's move on to the others. Because Once a Ranger has its own parallels as well, and I'm not just talking about shared origins of their respective titles. That special was the first to assemble a cross-generational Five Ranger team, representing a full spectrum of different colors and allowing a non-Red Ranger to lead said team to rescue other Rangers who had otherwise been incapacitated by a villain who had previously been locked away in a space dumpster. Plus, we have the subtle implication that these two stories might actually be connected in a story sense, as the minor plot point of Adam now being part of SPA may be linked to how he had previously interacted with SPD Ranger Bridge in Once a Ranger, suggesting that we may actually have something of a causality time loop happening here that is honestly not too dissimilar from Roborita's evil plan. Though Simon Bennett has gone on record saying that Space Patrol Alpha is really only meant to be an easter egg form foreshadowing, implying that it probably should not really be read into any more than that. But you can't blame me for trying. So that brings us to Megaforce and Super Megaforce, which... Um... Okay, I'm gonna be honest here, outside of the main cast acting as visual references to the archetypes of Mighty Morphin and the nods to Ernie's Juice Bar through the Froyo shop, Megaforce was far too occupied with making maximum use of its truncated Sentai source material to really add much of anything new to these milestone celebration tropes. Super Megaforce at least introduced something akin to the concept of proxy powers through the Ranger Keys, but even that was never really explored in a non-superficial fashion, and the Ranger cameos that we ultimately received during Legendary Battle itself were so brief that we didn't even really get the standard modicum of catch-up character development one would come to expect from a traditional team-up episode. And folding the appearance of every Ranger in existence into what was already serving as the finale of the then-current season really didn't do any favors to the few returning actors we did get to see. But I've already spent 41 episodes of Database Rangers Power Reviews running through all of Megaforce slash Super Megaforce, so if you really want to know my thoughts there, you can just go check out those videos. It's good, they're fun, the series is ending soon, so you should definitely be checking them out anyway. So with all that shameless plugging out of the way, we are finally nearing the end of this milestone rundown with Dimensions in Danger, where we get to see what is arguably the last step of evolution towards what would eventually become Once and Always, as we now have what appears to be a narrower character focus for our returning rangers and stronger attention to the underlying mechanics of the continuity references. And again, we have other, more obvious, superficial parallels in the form of JJ being referenced for the first time after his initial introduction in the comics, Rocky and Cat returning in Ranger forms that they had previously shared with other characters, and the whole concept of robotic replicants capturing Rangers acting as the primary physical threat of the story. But there's also one other key point of connection. 
The writers! Due to their impressively long tenures with the series, Becca Barnes and Alwyn Dale are now the first writers to work on not just one, but two different milestone celebrations. And that's not even getting into all the other work they've done to pay homage to the origins of the franchise since Dimensions in Danger aired, including major plot points for both Beast Morphers and Dino Fury, and our last major Mighty Morphin team-up, Grid Connection. And they're not the only crew members with experience on that front. Executive producer Simon Bennett, beyond being the showrunner for the most recent season, worked alongside Barnes and Dale under Chip Lynn as the director for Dimensions in Danger. And Charlie Haskell has been in a director's chair ever since the franchise first moved to New Zealand, working on previous team-ups, Thunderstorm, and Legendary Battle. In other words, there is a lot of experience going on behind the scenes here. And even though none of them were around at the very beginning, this very much is not the first time they've had to dip into the well of Mighty Morphin nostalgia, and it shows. Once and always is the evolution and culmination of not only 30 years of history, but also what cumulatively adds up to decades of experience of writing, directing, and producing Power Rangers in general, and milestone celebrations in particular, bringing together countless elements that we've seen sprinkled throughout the franchise over the years and blending them together in new ways. This especially makes sense when you take into account that despite all the milestone celebrations that there have been over the years, once and always still manages to be unique in its format. And no, I'm not talking about it being an extra long special, because we've technically had those before too, in the form of Clash of the Red Rangers, the extended legendary battle, and arguably the feature length films. Because there is still one key difference to be noted here. The current season's team is nowhere to be found. We don't have Cole, we don't have the Overdrive team, we don't have the Mega Force Rangers or the Ninja Steel Rangers, and the Dino Fury and Cosmic Fury cast is nowhere to be found outside of Annie's brief cameo reporting for Buzz Blast because for the first time ever, we are looking at these veteran rangers purely on their own terms and not through the lens of their active successors. This is, first and foremost, a celebration of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, not the Power Rangers franchise as a whole. And as such, the only new ranger we have here is Min, an original character with zero ties to the larger PR universe outside of her immediate ties to who these characters are as people. And that narrow focus opens up a world of depth. So much depth, in fact, that I don't really feel like I can cover it in a single video. We're already nearing the end of our standard runtime for a deeper look, and I haven't even touched on the twin milestones of David Yost's return as Billy and Walter Emanuel Jones's return as Zack being the longest break an actor has ever taken from the series, and the longest break an actor has ever taken from a specific role, marking over 26 years and over 28 years, respectively. And yes, those are separate milestones, as Jones did technically return to co-host the Lost Episode special back in 1999, and voice the Machine Empire General Jarek in Forever Red in 2002. And yes, I'm being pedantic at this point, because obviously I am. This is me. I've been doing this for over a decade. You must have some idea of what you're getting into when you click this video. Just like you've probably also noticed that this is a deeper look, part one. We've got a lot more left to cover here, people. We still need to touch on the lore, the world, the characters, the production, the visuals, the Easter eggs, and of course the actual story and themes at the heart of Once and Always, which is far too much for me to try and squeeze into a single video unless I want to try and make this into a full-length feature itself, and trust me, don't think that thought hasn't popped into my head. But honestly, I'm already working on what will likely be three of the longest scripted videos I've ever done for this channel, and I really don't want to add a fourth to that list, especially when I still haven't finished the deeper looks at Dino Fury, which I swear I'm going to work on as soon as the Power Reviews finale is done, which will hopefully be by the end of this summer, fingers crossed, knock on wood, because I know that Cosmic Fury is supposed to be coming out in the fall, even though we don't have a date yet, and I'd really like to have the last season fully covered before the new season, and I've got a lot on my plate. Like, my plate is like this, but it's stacked up like this, and I, I just, I just really have a lot to do. Wow. So make sure to join me in two weeks for a deeper look at the world of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers once and always. And if you would like to share this week's rapid run-through, you can find it as a standalone clip over at Morphin Legacy's YouTube channel. Please like, share, subscribe to us both, ring the bell for future notifications, and until next time, farewell Ranger fans, let the power protect you.